I think we're going to get started, folks. Just a second here. We'll uh, get this faded down here. A um, little vibe change today because it's spring. Whoosh. Springtime. Sort of feels like it. I'm uh, going to find something to do outside this evening for sure, um, even if it's just staring at the dirt. Um, that's pretty much all you can do right now. Fire. Fire is an option. It's good fire weather. So, um, hey, everybody. Uh, we are jumping back into Rhino for our last day with Rhino. Um, was that a sigh of exasperation, a sigh of relief? Hard to know. Difficult, difficult to know. Um, but in any case, this is our last day of Rhino. Um, maybe you loved Rhino. Maybe you thought it was like the greatest app ever. Maybe, uh, maybe it's not your thing. That's fine. We're going to move on. And then you'll have something else to like or not like, depending on you know, how that goes. So um, yeah, we are today our goal is to uh, get our model from the point where we left it on Wednesday, which was with lighting. Uh, it's pretty much fully lit, um, except uh, we don't have any materials, and we haven't really talked about rendering. So we're going to do those two things uh, today. And those are pretty big things. Um, so uh, one thing that I do a lot when I'm collaborating with other people is I write what are called change logs, um, which basically are just like a summary of what I changed since the last person worked on something. So in this case, my change log is only one thing, and that is that I made this lamp um, and the lights inside of it a little bit smaller. Um, so you may recall it used to be about this tall, and I just I just made it shorter so it didn't look like it was like overpowering everything else. Um, so I wanted it to be in kind of like more uh, comfortable relational scale with everything else. So uh, what I think I'm going to do today is we're going to run through kind of uh, the basics of materials and then we'll get into rendering uh, after we get the materials on. And then uh, lastly, we will be actually doing some rendering. Um, it's possible that in class tomorrow, if we look at our um, sort of thing, I have a lecture scheduled for tomorrow uh, to sort of talk about, I know, like not making anything. Um, but it's possible that tomorrow we might be able to do some follow-up uh, if we need to on the rendering. Um, and the reason we might need to do follow-up on the rendering is because I am going to do at least one render that is going to take uh, up to a day. Uh, to process. So we might be doing a little bit of a side-by-side -side comparison of different render models to ask ourselves, is it really worth it? Um, <laughs> you'll answer that question. So, um, so to get this rendered, we could render it as is, by the way. We just get a black and white rendering, which there's totally nothing wrong with that, um, especially if I'm doing something for like a gallery or a museum and I'm not 100% sure that they're going to hire me to do the job, pfft, they don't need color. Um, <laughs> I'll just do it in black and white just to kind of give them a bit like an idea of what it might look like. Um, so yeah, if you're, if you're, you know, like not doing something just for yourself and you're not being maybe compensated the way you would like, um, you know, color is a bonus. Um, but probably the first thing that I'm going to talk about as far as materials go is the floor. Um, so it's a really common convention that in gallery spaces the floors are some sort of wood. Um, and actually, this is probably the one and only time I will ever teach class in, a, in an environment that actually has a real wood floor. Um, so that's a little bit happy. Um, one thing that I guess I would, you know, the one thing that I point out about a real wood floor probably doesn't apply to this floor, so never mind. But we will take maybe just a quick glance down at the floor. Um, so the first thing we need to do before we make uh, a so-called material, there are certain materials that are sort of loaded into Rhino that have everything you need to um, make a believable texture and they have shininess, they have the color, they have what's called the um, UV mapping. And um, what we're going to start off doing is making our own texture. So um, in order to do that, I'm going to, first of all, want to unlock the room uh, layer. I locked it earlier because I thought that was uh, 
important for me to do at the time. Now it's not because I really would like to address the floor. So you could probably um, focus more on the perspective view for this part of the, um, of the process. Um, you probably will still need the other views just in case you have to declare like a direction for one of the textures or something like that. But for the most part, I think we can confine ourselves to the perspective view. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you my textures folder, which is a folder of stuff that I've kind of assembled. Um, and these are things that you can just find for free online. Um, if you're doing professional game development or professional 3D animation development, you probably would maybe consider buying yourself like a membership at one of these websites like TurboSquid is the one that I personally like. Um, but there's a t so much that you can find for free online, um, especially if you're just looking for simple textures, I wouldn't bother paying for it. So this is an ideal three-dimensional tech, or an ideal texture for a three-dimensional environment, and for a couple of reasons. One, it's designed to tile. So if you look at um, the actual texture itself, it will repeat seamlessly. Um, the other thing that I would point out about this texture in particular that makes it look good is um, the fact that it doesn't have like a really strong contrast between dark and light. And if it does, it's spread out evenly over the image. So um, there's a bunch of other textures in here. My interest really is in showing you how to find these. So I'm going to uh, shop right now on the Googles for wood texture. Now, if you just type wood texture, you'll come up with a bunch of like real wood um, that probably actually wouldn't be that useful to you because it's like people who are looking for the actual texture of wood. Um, and we're not looking for the actual texture of wood. We're looking for a texture that's tileable in a digital environment. So adding things like seamless, adding things like tile to your, um, uh, to your search will narrow that down and kind of get you past the sort of like, this is my Pinterest on how I like to faux finish wood or whatever, you know, that will inevitably come up. Um, so if we start looking for wood texture seamless, these look like much more plausible as digital textures. So I'm just gonna um, load up the full page. Um, this one, actually, I would probably say it is seamless, but it looks like it has this kind of light spot here, so I would stay away from one like this. This one looks really good. Um, so it has some texture, but it's not like jumping out at you. This also looks really good. This looks really good. This one looks really good. Um, and in this case, we're actually looking for floor, so you, if you add the modifier floor, it'll come in with, um, you know, slats, which is really exactly what we're looking for. So all of, there's so many, I mean, so many to choose from. I'm gonna go ahead and just stick with the one that we have, but just to demonstrate, if you wanted to use one of these, um, all you have to do is just save, uh, save image as, and put it in a folder where you can locate it. Done. Super easy. So let's go ahead and think about assigning a, a material to this. So there's um, a texture, which we've been talking about. It's this image that gets repeated. But what we need before we can have a texture in Rhino, just wanted to make sure I was recording. What we need to have for uh, a, a texture to work is we need to have a material. So you can, I don't ask me why they did it this way. It's ridiculous you click on this thing that looks like a tube of toothpaste, and that's the material uh, tab. Um, every time I use toothpaste, I think about that. Um, so anyway, uh, now you can assign materials by layer. I don't personally do it that way. Um, but if you have things that are um, organized that way in your layers, you can definitely do that. What we're gonna do is we're gonna make a custom material. So we're gonna click this little plus icon and go to custom, and then uh, we wanna scroll all the way down to where it says color texture, and this is the part where we put in our floorboard texture. 
Um, people, oh, hey, that's pretty good, right out of the gate. Um, we'll make some adjustments to this in a, just a second. People ask me all the time, uh, what is a good file size for a texture? And um, I guess I would say, obviously, it varies widely. If you're only using one or two textures in your, in your entire model, you could get away with having an extremely high resolution texture. We are gonna be using lots of textures, um, and they're gonna be repeated a lot of different times. So my sort of general rule of thumb is that 1,000 pixels is a good sort of thing to aim for. Um, now, that's a very general rule of thumb. I'll give you a hint. If you're having uh, problems opening your Rhino file after you assign all your textures, that's a, actually a really good indication that you have your, some of your textures are too large. And so one thing that you can do, it's pretty easy, if you find that you need to use a smaller texture, don't do anything in Rhino, just go directly to the file that you have embedded into Rhino and just resize it in Photoshop and it should, like, should autom automatically refresh in Rhino and then you can just get rid of some of that overhead. So in general, I guess like a good sort of other rule of thumb is no more than 20 megabytes of texture data per Rhino file. So we won't be anywhere near that. Um, so that means you'd have to use 20 thousand by thousand pixel textures, which is like a lot. Um, so yeah, just something to keep an eye on because it is something that will jack up your uh, system requirements quite rapidly. So, okay, so I said we wanted to make some adjustments to this. Well, first of all, miraculously, somehow, the wood floorboards are actually going in the right direction, which typically, the wood floorboards go along the direction that someone is supposed to walk. I bet you've never thought about that, but it's true. Check it out sometime. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, anyway, so they're going in the right direction, but let's go ahead and click on this box and, excuse me, not the box, we'll click on, click on the file name. And this whole kind of menu comes up called the content editor. And so I can go ahead and show you how to flip it around just uh, so that you can. So here we could rotate it 90 degrees. And now you can see it's just bloop, other direction. I kind of like it the way it was, so I'll make that bigger. Now, you can't really adjust the individual texture's size. It doesn't really work that way. In Rhino, what you're aiming for is not the overall size of the texture, but the number of times it repeats. So, in this case, it's repeating one time over our floor, and we could probably make it repeat 10 times if we wanted to. I don't know, that might seem actually like a little bit too small, so I will maybe go for something more like three. Now, you'll notice that these two are locked together. That's so that it stays proportional. If you wanted to you know, skew it, you can unlock this button and then make it stretch um, in either dimension, okay? So at this point, we can just uh, click Apply. And so we've modified our texture settings here. Now, um, another thing that I want to go ahead and texture while we're here in the room is I would really like to texture the walls. Now, I know what you're saying. You're saying, like, Meg, like, the walls are white. Everybody knows that. Like, white walls are white walls. And I would say, hmm. well, I disagree. Um, so, <laughs> uh, actually, there's quite a bit of texture that goes into walls, um, even painted walls. So, I just happen to have a texture for um, a wall, sort of like a generic wall texture. And this, having a texture like this would do a couple of things. It would actually slightly affect the way that light bounce, bounces off of it. Um, so that would be potentially important. And then also, it just gives your work like a little bit less of a kind of sharp look. Um, so we wanna kind of soften the entire environment when we're adding textures. So we're gonna just go ahead and add one here. Um, when you start to texture things, whatever isn't textured starts to like really stick out like a lot. So, so texturing these things is actually fairly important. So I'm gonna go ahead and make another custom texture. And in this case, I will use that white map plaster texture. 
And I do, it's way too big right now, so I'm going to um, just scale it down a bit. And that looks fine. So sometimes you saw it just flash for a second at the larger scale. Sometimes it does that when you're making adjustments to the textures. So just have, have faith, hit the apply button, it'll be fine. Um, I think that's a bug. Okay, so then you can see there's a slight texture applied to that. Um, and now the next thing that I want to do is sort of think about some of these other items that we have. So I'll go back to locking the room because I'm pretty much done with that. And in here, I think I'll start with this object right here. Um, it looks like right now my boat is all one uh, group. So I will definitely ungroup it because I want to address this sort of narwhal horn thing uh, by itself. And I think uh, instead of giving this a custom texture, I'm going to give it one of the textures that are in the Rhino texture material menu. So um, in this case, I think I'm going to go for metal. So instead of uh, creating a custom material, I'm creating this metal material. And then it will uh, give me a list of drop down options here, and then also uh, a drop down here, which in this case, I think I actually want it super shiny. So I'm going to go for that. And then if we go to color, it has some presets for color. So I'm going to choose gold. And no texture, I want it to be extremely polished. So I'm going to take the polish all the way up to the top uh, of its range. And so you can see that I'm getting you know, some sort of like uh, indication of what that looks like here. Now, I want to be completely honest with you all. When you do this type of work um, in Rhino, whatever you're seeing at this point in this rendered viewport is very not a lot. It's not, it, hang on, let me just track back one second. It only vaguely resembles what you will get when you render it. Um, because the rendering just does a lot more sort of light reflection and um, it will render the materials at a much higher resolution. So, so what you're using the, the rendered viewport for really is just as a, as a preview. And I think it's really important for everyone to understand that that's a, actually a preview. It's not what you'll get when you render. So a couple of other materials that I think I want to work with right now. One is um, I think I'd like to go ahead and um, texture this boat. This is going to be a little bit more complicated just because it's a co more complicated form. So um, I can probably use this wood texture that I already created, this wood material. Um, in this case, it looks like that is just fine. Um, now, I might need to create a second wood material to sort of adjust this. Um, but for now, I'm just kind of laying that wood material onto all of these um, little parts here. And it looks like somehow I didn't get this part. There we go. Um, so it's a little bit hard to tell because it's in shadow. Um, also, I have this wing thing, which we talked about the wing thing being wooden, but then the other part of it not being um, wooden. And so I'm probably would be a good thing for me right now just to kind of get rid of the room so I don't have that distraction and uh, just make sure that I know what's going on here. So it looks like the whole thing is grouped. Um, and yeah, so all of these little poly surfaces are um, needing to be selected, which is kind of a bummer. So probably what I'll do at this point, just because I don't like extra work, I'm going to go ahead and delete this one, and I'll assign the material to this one, and then flip it over, copy it over. So that way I don't have to like, you know, select every little part of it. So let me get in here. Okay, so this is the sort of space between the so-called wooden shapes. And for this one, I think I will use a pre-made uh, material. I think I'm going to actually use plastic, which might be count somewhat counterintuitive. 
Um, but the reason that I'm using plastic material is that it ha has really nice transparency um, and it's also really smooth. So if I wanted to add like a paper texture on top of the plastic, I could probably do that. I doubt we'll have time today, but I'm gonna go ahead and give it a shot anyway. So here we can just jack up the transparency, maybe not that much, um, just a bit. And now you can see that you know, this object obviously is, is transparent and then the other objects are not. So now I'm gonna do this sort of like somewhat tedious job that I, you could make the argument that I should have done this uh, when we were originally doing it. I probably should have grouped these um, just as is. Hey, you know, today is always different than yesterday. So it's not that bad. I have, you know, other things to complain about probably than having to select these. But in general, this is the kind of thing that I try to avoid. Um, one strategy, if you had like a whole lot of things to select and you didn't want to kind of go through it like I am right now, um, you could potentially uh, just sort of make everything else invisible and then do an edit select objects. That would be a good way to deal with it. But we're sort of right on that threshold of, of not having enough, quite enough to care about it that much. Okay, so now I can select these all at once and assign this wood material to them. Brilliant. So now select the big wing and I'm just gonna flip it over using the mirror command. All right. Now, the nice thing about this, I'm not sure if you can quite tell, right now you can see that there's not really like a, an appreciable amount of light coming through these, um, this transparency, but when we render it, we will get shadows from the sort of frame object. Um, and that's one of the many differences from using the sort of preview screen to actually rendering things for real. So let me go ahead and bring the room back up. Whoa, hello. And I think I wanna do, we've got two more things in the scene that I would really like to go ahead and stick materials on. So one is that I would like to put some materials on this. So let's use a material that we have not used before. Um, let's use maybe one of the metal materials. And I think for this one, I'll make it um, sort of reflective uh, silver as well as being a light that has objects coming out of it. And then as far as a bump map, um, it's not really something that you have to have, um, but it is something that can add another dimension of texture. It's just kind of like a black and white uh, image that gets repeated and then it gets interpreted as texture. So if we go to the leather texture, um, I usually make these like extra large. Um, and you can see it just sort of like roughs up the surface a little bit. It keeps it from being completely um, metallic. And then for this object, um, I don't really have like a preconceived um, notion for this object, but I think probably we could maybe try one of the gemstone materials. Um, so the gemstone materials, if you're looking to work in glass, um, or if you're looking to work with glass forms, um, I don't want to like rain on anybody's parade, but glass is super hard. Um, and I don't just mean like hard. Um, <laughs> it's super difficult. Um, so the gem materials are like a little bit easier to work with. They just don't, because basically with glass, you can go really quickly from having something that looks like something to having something that looks like literally nothing. And there's very little kind of wiggle room uh, in between where the gem materials are sort of like loaded with a little color and they just, tend, personally, I think they tend to get better results. So if I go to make this maybe amethyst, for example, um, you can see it's this kind of clear blobby lavender thing, you know? Don't worry, it'll look better when we render it. 
So at this point, I think we should probably jump into a rendering. And um, probably the first thing that I really like, you know, definitely like to do when I render stuff is to sort of, you know, compose it in the, in the window here. And then the other thing that I want to sort of think about is like what aspect ratio I want the rendering to be at. So in this case, I think um, probably having the rendering somewhere like around there um, looks like a decent aspect ratio. Like in other words, it looks like uh, the type of rectangle that could lead to something that looks reasonable. What would be a bad aspect ratio? I mean, I guess there's no such thing as a bad aspect ratio, but, but this would probably be a bad aspect ratio, <laughs> um, where you know, it's, uh, it's taking, first of all, all of this stuff is just wasted, wasted pixels, um, because you know, our, our scene is not even kind of in the, the sort of uh, window area. And then the other thing is that, you know, I mean, maybe this would be perfect if you had a special purpose that it, it was for, but I think what we're looking for for this class is something more like a, um, an actual, uh, like a photographic uh, snapshot. So you can kind of tw twizzle this along forever. Um, I'm one of those people that kind of can't really put stuff like that down. Um, but for now, let's just go ahead and, and work with this. So we talked about one major thing uh, regarding rendering uh, already. And if you're having a little bit of struggle right now with getting the lighting to work, um, it might be because you missed the tip in the last video, which I'll remind you of right now. That is, um, when you go to the render properties, it's a good idea to turn the skylight off. Um, so we have been working with the skylight completely off. And you can see what happens if we turn the skylight on. Um, our sort of beautiful, dramatic uh, lighting has gone to like, it's like super diffuse, like, you know, you're working in a cubicle with this thing. Um, so we don't necessarily want that. We want to turn the skylight back off. Um, but definitely, uh, so if you're working with custom lighting objects, for sure, turn the skylight off. And um, there's a couple of other settings that really matter. One is we have to sort of set the quality for this. And I suggested that everybody do uh, a 2,000 pixel uh, render or to wind up with a rendering that's 1920 by 1080, right? Um, that's what it should say on the reality, on reality assignment sheet. Um, I wrote it, so I, I know. Um, and then from there, you can go to quality settings. So quality settings are just that. They're sort of groupings of settings that you could probably get in there and adjust individually, but they're guidelines for creating best, better, and then not as good. So we're going to start off with not as good, which is the draft quality. And the reason why we're going to start off with a draft quality rendering, well, I can guarantee you that the draft quality rendering will be ready in less than two minutes. Um, I cannot guarantee that of the final quality rendering. It might take a half hour. So um, definitely, if you're just rendering for the first time, uh, I would advise you to, to go ahead and do a draft quality rendering. And then if your computer doesn't die, try a good. And then if your computer doesn't die, try a final. And I'm being dramatic when I say your computer might die. It probably won't, but more likely is that you will get tired of not watching whatever you were watching before um, on your computer, or you will want to go out with your friends, and you'll have to just like put your computer away and, and leave and let it finish, because um, it does take time. So right now, we're using what's called the Rhino Render. Um, Personally, I prefer to use, uh, especially for this class, because I know a lot of you have different types of laptops, and you also maybe don't have, I know it breaks my heart to say this, but I've heard from some other people that you might not have unlimited time for 107 homework. Um, yeah, so, so I would recommend that you use the legacy Rhino renderer, um, because the other renderer is the one that can take days. Um, the legacy Rhino renderer, you might have, a, I wasn't sure if you were yawning or you were just like, oh my god. <laughs> um, the, yeah, it just takes a long time. Okay, so for now we're going to use the legacy Rhino renderer and later in class I'll show you the, the sort of other one. 
And so there are some other options here that you definitely want to be aware of. You can turn on the curves um, for your render if you want to. So if you, if you really are doing something that has kind of a cartoony aesthetic or you know, even a drafts person-like aesthetic and you want those lines to be visible, you can definitely do that. Um, so from here, we can just close the settings and then uh, we can either go up to the render menu and uh, render or you can hit this little blue button right here, right there. So I'm gonna let it go. So it brings up this window and you might be looking at it and you might be thinking, oh man, that is not what I want at all. That's just not it. Like, um, yeah, don't panic. It's, um, it crops the, the image. It just gives you a little piece of the image at first. So, so this is done. And you might also be asking yourself, well, how, that looks pretty decent. Like, how do we tell that that's a draft rendering? Um, sure, let's look at where it probably failed. So where it probably failed is that these, uh, the textures are probably not rendered as, in as high fidelity as they could be. You can see this is kind of like tiled up, which is a little weird. Um, if we also look into like shadows like this, those shadows can get super complex. And it looks like right now that shadow is actually pretty simple. So let's pretend that this is the best rendering that we've gotten. It won't be, but... Um, we want to go ahead and save it, and I apologize that there's not a better method of saving this, but you basically have to click this thing. This resembles an object that um, former sort of like old people know as a floppy disk drive, um, and that's the icon that's supposed to let everyone know that we should save it. Yeah, I'm, you can't make this stuff up, you know? Um, so yeah, you would uh, just go to save rendering as, and then uh, there's also a setting in the menu where you can go to file, save as. Um, so yeah, so here we go to, um, you can save it pretty much wherever you want. I would advise you to save it as a PNG. Um, and there it is. So let's make another rendering. Um, First of all, I think that in terms of render settings, I would probably like to show you the difference between the draft rendering and the uh, good rendering. So if we go in here to good, um, and we're keeping the scale the same, et cetera, et cetera. That beach ball of death kind of lets you know that it's working. Yeah, it's important. So yeah, I mean, probably the best thing to do here is, I'm just gonna go ahead and save this as like render two. Um, and we'll look at them uh, side by side. Uh, so render two is good, and then probably there's one more thing that I wanted to show you, and this might not even finish until the end of class, or I might have to do it overnight at home. Um, the other renderer, which is called Rhino Render, is what's called a ray tracing renderer. And when we use something like a ray tracing renderer, you're gonna see a huge difference um, in terms of the materials and shadow quality in glass, transparent objects, and reflective objects. So if you're not, do, if you're not committed to your project having like awesome levels of glass, metal, or reflective objects, please do not bother with the Rhino render because it will not do you any good. Um, it really only helps with those things. And so uh, for that um, being said, it will take, I would be shocked if this finished by the time class was over. But it might. When you, um, 
when you do ray tracing, it's part of, it has a sort of um, set of uh, algorithms that basically take light from the source and they follow the light as it bounces around the room and they do this a certain number of times. And that's why it looks kind of grainy right now. It's because those little photons of light are just still bouncing around the scene. And so you can see right away that like this object looks like way better in the ray trace renderer. Um, it's not getting that weird tiling. Um, the only problem with the ray tracing renderer that I have is not that it doesn't look great. Um, my only problem with it is that uh, it takes, like, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this, it takes forever. Um, so uh, I'll go ahead and keep this one running um, and we'll just see what happens. If I bring it in on Wednesday, then you can do like a side-by-side -side comparison. Um, but in terms of the sort of like good, better, best thing, um, I can definitely show you the renders that we made today to sort of, so this one I would say, this was the one that we did at the draft um, setting level and I feel like this one is okay. Um, Probably, if I were doing uh, this whole project, I would consider just flipping the orientation on all of these uh, wooden objects, just so the grain kind of goes in the other direction. That's a little, you know, kind of a tell. Um, and then, uh, if I look at the other one, the other one probably is not, I doubt this is gonna be noticeably better. Um, but definitely one of the things that we can see in both of these is like a certain a type of softness that creeps in, um, even at full resolution. So, pardon me. <laughs> Go away. Oh gosh, y'all. I got windows. All right. So yeah, there's like a certain softness kind of even when it's at scale and that's a little, you know, just a little troubling. Um, but in general, if this, you know, were something that uh, a student turned in, like I don't think that I would think twice about like some of this noise. Um, so it's probably still pretty good. Um, so, okay, so we're at two minutes here, and uh, this is where, you know, you get something that actually, like, starts to look good on the screen, and then it goes for, like, another 18 hours. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll bring, I'll definitely bring this in um, the next time we meet, but, I mean, I definitely want you to sort of, like, take away from today that using the Rhino render, which is the, the so-called legacy render, that that is something that is really, like, a special, hello? Um, Sorry, kind of a special purpose thing. <gasps> I was just thinking for a second, maybe I'm out of batteries. That's wild. Oh, hang on. Okay. Hmm. All right. Now, I just wanna say that what just happened is a really great example of why you might not want to uh, set your desktop background to black. I personally love having a black desktop background, but it has gotten me in trouble a couple times. So, <laughs> I know, right? Um, yeah, so, so other things sort of re relating to rendering. Um, well, while one thing that's kind of annoying is that while this is running, we're not gonna be able to sort of do anything. So I'll render this at home um, without you. And this is also the part where it could also kind of bring your laptop down. Um, so probably if you're doing like a large or a final render, it would be mm, maybe a good, a good idea to just kind of make sure that your um, computer isn't doing anything important like your taxes or, I don't know, like, you know, trying to sign up for classes um, because it does have a tendency to kind of like lock everything else up. Um, so I sort of feel like I've covered what we need to cover, you know, towards the assignment. Does anyone have any questions about rendering? 
Awesome. So, so my goal is definitely for next class to bring you like a side-by-side -side comparison of these rendering methods um, so we can see, you know, is it wor really worth it? Maybe. Um, and uh, we will start sort of talking about code and making art with code. So um, yeah, I'm gonna just kind of let my computer think about what it's done for a while and uh, we'll, we'll have a chat later. So uh, enjoy your day, and I'll see you all on Wednesday. Try to get outside a little bit in the next couple days. <laughs>